Hello, this is Brian Houle. I'm a solutions consultant with Beyond 20. And today uh, I'm going to look at the REST API in Shareable Service Management 9.1, uh, mainly through the Swagger UI that ships with the tool. Uh, so in a previous video, I looked, up, uh, I looked at setting up a user for the API and a client ID uh, for the API. Uh, so to review real quickly, I'm in the orange pill or administrator tool. And um, I'm going into the security category. And if I look at my users, you'll see that I've set up this CSD API user with an API security group, and uh, which I've got separate from all my other user security groups so that I can apply whatever and exact permissions uh, to the API user that I want. And I don't have to worry about um, uh, other users access. So, by having its own security group, I can give it exactly those permissions that it needs and no more. And uh, the second part of this is I went into the REST API settings and created a new REST API client key. And uh, that is this right here. And I've added an extra long token lifespan of 240 minutes just because, uh, you know, I'm assuming I'm in development. Um, but usually this is something more modest, like 20 minutes uh, for a production environment. So I'm going to copy this key out. The next thing I'm going to do is uh, take a look at the swagger that ships with this. So um, you don't have to do anything else. When you install your browser clients, you'll, uh, you'll have this. I'm on a local VM, so you know, it just says local host. Um, this you replace with the actual um, URL of your um, Sharewell install, and then you'll add, you'll append this to that. Um, Sharewell API swagger UI index. Um, so what I, what I do next is I'm going to take my client key and paste it here. So let me uh, let me take this out. It'll it'll say client ID here, and that's where you're going to paste your key. Now, um, the rest of the page I have a link to the Sharewell REST API documentation that takes me out, um, and then I've got all of these nodes here, and these are sort of um, clusters of calls that I can make. So if I drop each of them down, I'll get actual endpoints that I can access. And so I'm going to look under searches, perform search operations. And this gives me um, all the endpoints and then I get a quick description of what it does. Uh, so I'm going to go down and I'm going to look for run a ser safe search by name. And so if I click this down, it gives me some implementation notes. It's all, all, also the response class that I'm likely to get back. And so this is sort of the structure of it and um, the status of a successful call, which is 200. Um, so this allows me, however, to test the calls right here, which is very useful. So, um, you know, you can try to execute the calls from here before you try to execute them in your application. And if you drop this down, you can change the content type on your response. Uh, but you'll also notice I have all these uh, spaces for parameters. And so we would fill those in as we go. So let's try that. Um, so I've entered my client key. The next thing I'm going to do is find this uh, little authentication toggle. And I'm going to go ahead and click it. And uh, I'll go ahead and put in my authentication. So I'm going to use that CSD API user account. And I'll go ahead and click Authorize. Now it says on. Uh, I didn't get an error message, so it, it's accepted my credentials. So there's a couple things we're going to do. First, I need an association. Um, and that really is the business object ID uh, of the uh, business object associated with the stored search I'm going to run. So again, here I'm running a, I'm making an API call to run a stored search in Sharewell and return the results. So I need that association. So to do that, I'm going to go into Sharewell. And I'm just going to create a, a new blueprint. And I want to look for an incident. I know this is going to be an incident search. So I'll find the incident business object. And next thing I want to do, I want to go to edit business object and bizob properties. So I'll click that button. 
when that pops up, I'll go to Advanced, and finally, I'll have my Business Object ID here. So I'll select this, and this should be fairly, um, I'm going to copy it, it should be fairly long. Um, it's the internal ID or GUID for the incident object, and this should be the same across all ShareWell implementations. Um, that ID is not changing. So I'm going to click Cancel, and I'll leave the blueprint going for a second, and I'm going to go back to my Swagger, and I'm going to put this in. So I'll paste that in. So that's my first part. I'm going to need that ID. The second part is the scope. What scope am I accessing here? So for, to, to talk about that, let's go into the blue pill, and let's go to our search manager. All right, so here we have our association. We put that ID in for incident. When it's asking for scope, it's really talking about this side here. So is it user scope, role scope, team scope, or global scope? Um, there's also the blueprint scope, but um, we'll, we're going to work with the global scope today. So I've got the global scope selected, and really the search that I want to fire is this one, all closed incidents within the past year. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm going to copy that so I remember it. But you'll notice it is in the global scope. So when we go to our uh, back to Swagger, I'm going to type in global. There, my autocomplete has done the work for me. Next, uh, scope owner. Now, we don't have a scope owner because it's in the global scope. But if this were to uh, be executed perhaps out of a team uh, scope or a user scope, then we would have to provide that. Um, now, under search name, this is where we specify the name of, this, of the saved search. So I've already um, copied that out. I'm going to just paste it in as is. I don't have to do anything fancy with the spaces here. The Swagger tool will take care of that for me. And then the next thing I can do is I can go in and I can provide optionally some search terms, uh, the page number and the page size, and whether or not I want to include the schema. I'm going to leave all these blank for now. Um, so that should do it. Um, oh, except I still need a scope owner of none. Can't leave that blank. So let's look at our parameters again. So I've got the business object ID of the incident object. I've got my global for my scope, none for scope owner, and I've got the name of my search. So now I'm going to go try it out, and hopefully it doesn't error out. Let's see what happens. If I get it right, I got it right. All right, so now it's executed. And here's what's been returned. So it sent, it gives me the curl, the curl syntax for the call that I've just made. It gives me the request URL for the call I just made with all the parameter values put in. So as you can see, it gives me all the the you know parameter and value pairs. And you'll notice that my search name is automatically URL encoded. So that's cool. So now I can kind of take this and stick it into my application as I want. Now, scrolling down, under the response body, um, it, it, it sends me my JSON object back. So I've got business objects, um, then it'll show me my bizob ID, and that's the ID that I sent for the association. Um, it'll give a public ID, so that's our ticket number, and the rec ID of the business object. This is all useful information to an application developer. Um, and then I'll have an array for each field. So I've got um, my incident type uh, is the field name. Here's the field ID, um, the value, and the, uh, the internal name of the field. And a lot of times the internal name is just the display name with no spaces. Um, so that we can see that this is an incident owned by team is first level support. I got my incident ID here the name of the customer. So yeah, so an external application can do all sorts of things with this information. Um, so for instance, if you were doing some sort of custom portal, you know, this is a great way to return all, um, all incidents in the system. And if I scroll down even more, I've got my uh, response code 200, it was a successful call, and my response headers. Uh, so I can do a search that way. So again, what we've done is we've used the, the REST API to execute a stored search in ShareWell based on the search name. Now, if I wanted to, I can, as long as I keep this name consistent, I can change 
the clauses in that stored search in ShareWell without upsetting the API uh, call itself. Um, so in other words, if I just wanted all closed incidents within the past year, but I also wanted to include service requests as well, in ShareWell, I just need to change that stored value a little bit. If I leave the, the search name the same, then this, this call does not have to be modified at all. So that's a great way to pull data from ShareWell. But you'll notice, um, I'm going to go back up to our top level. I can also, um, if I drop down my, my uh, business objects category here and scroll down, I can actually create a new ticket in ShareWell if I am so inclined. So if I scroll down, do, 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 we'll see the save business object endpoint. There it is. Um, and you'll notice that this creates and or updates a business object. So if I want to create a, a ticket, I'm going to use the save business object endpoint for that. And you'll see a lot of the same stuff. I'm already authenticated, so my token should still be good. Um, it'll give me my model, so it's the same as, as what it returns. But uh, it's a little different here. I don't have parameters. Um, I've actually got to send uh, a request object in it. And you'll notice uh, this is a post type. So um, I'm going to keep this all the same. And now I'm going to put in a, the, the JSON object that would represent a request. Now, what we have to do is make sure that we're including all the required fields for incident in order to create the ticket. And if you pop over uh, to our, our ticket, if you look, we can see, and I'm going to sort the details out. If we scroll down, um, you know, I'm sorting by details. That kind of lets me see all my required fields. So, for instance, call source and priority are both required. Um, I probably want to include service category and subcategory, even though they're not required, uh, because uh, I want to, um, you know, have my ticket validated. You'll also notice, um, you know, so I want it uh, classified properly here. So I've also got my short description and description are required, and uh, I believe customer ID is also required. Let's double check. So yeah, so you want to make sure that you're sending along all the required information uh, to create your ticket. So there's customer ID. You'll notice that too was required. So let's go ahead and build a response. Uh, I'm sorry, a request object. Okay, so I've got my response uh, already built. So let me just pop it up here. Oops, too big. All right, so um, I've just built out my JSON object with my IDs and all my required fields. So again, we have our bizob ID and then our fields array. So I've got service and the field ID for service, the name, and the value that I'm sending. Now, if this is an external application, for instance, I might send um, this as a, you know, th this would be a variable that uh, I would call on when I build this in my external application. But for right now, I'm just providing literal values. So I've got service, category, subcategory, short description, description, a default priority, and the customer display name that I know is valid. Um, and uh, customer ID is required, but um, I know that um, customer ID is auto-populated when customer display name is set in ShareWell, so I'm letting that do the work. So I'm going to make sure to copy everything, get all my opening and close brackets. I'm going to go back into Swagger. I'm going to paste this into my request parameter here. Okay, so um, that's in. I want to make sure I've got it all in. I've already authenticated, yes. So now I'm going to click the Try It Out button, and I get a response back. So what this does is it gives me the curl um, uh, version of what I put in in my parameter. And uh, I have the request URL, my response body, and of course uh, a response code 200. I know it's good. Um, so what this is returning is very small. Um, the first endpoint we used, it was a, a search, so I got a big old hunk of response back. This one is just returning some basics. So it's letting me know what the incident ID is. So that's my public ID. 
but it's also returning the rec ID of the new ticket. Um, and so I have these two pieces of information, so it's confirming that that ticket has been created. Uh, let's go check, take a look in the blue pill to confirm. So that's 102275. And I'm going to go out. I'm going to go just do an open search in my task pane for my tickets. Click go. And 102275, there it is. So there's my short description, my priority, my description. It's classified as I need it to be. And because I classified it as I did, you'll notice that the proper specifics form shows up. So this is super useful to me. If I'm in an external application, I can feed uh, ShareWell this request. It can create the ticket. And then with these results returned, for instance, I can now redirect uh, my uh, user, for instance, to the portal view of that newly created ticket if I were so inclined because I just all I need to do is build the URL, um, you know, the deep link URL with my public ID and I've got everything I need. So that was just a short look at a couple of operations we can perform in Swagger with the Sharewell REST API. There are tons more, so feel free to explore. And uh, thanks for watching and uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel for more Sharewell videos. Thank you.